Rutgers football coming off an initial success in the Big Ten with the Maryland victory, a big, huge comeback victory over the Terps to conclude the regular season. And then, of course, the demolition of North Carolina in the bowl game. So what do the uh, Scarlet Knights have for the rest of the Big Ten here in 2015? We bring in Dan Dugan of NJ.com to help us break down Rutgers football with the opener just about three weeks away. Dan, th thanks so much for joining us. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, let's talk about this quarterback situation. It seemed as though Gary Nova had the job forever, and he certainly had his detractors, but piled up a ton of yardage and mostly successful outings in getting uh, Rutgers to postseason play uh, every year. He was the starter. So we've got a two-way battle right now. We've got the LSU transfer, Hayden Reddick, and also Chris Laviano. Uh, at this point, appears to have a slight advantage in the competition. How do these... Um, two quarterbacks compare in regards to style and who do you think has the edge at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with going back to Gary Nova. I've been kind of leading the, the bandwagon that you don't know what you got till it's gone. I think a lot of Rutgers fans couldn't wait till the day that he was gone. But when you look back at what he did last year, it's gonna be tough for a first year starter to come in and replicate that. Like he, you know, you mentioned the Maryland game. Uh, he was huge in the Michigan game. Again, it's just tough to see a first year starter come in and do that. Um, you know, as you said, Chris Laviano is a slight edge right now. I think most of that can be attributed to the fact that he was the backup last year. So he got all the reps uh, behind Nova in practice. I uh, got in mop up time, um, even a little, a couple of games with Gary got banged up. Uh, so he, he's got some meaningful snaps. Uh, that, that's totally helped his confidence, uh, his understanding of the offense. So that was his biggest advantage of the spring. Um, uh, because if you're going to have just a straight up quarterback competition with who can throw the ball better. Uh, Hayden Reddick would win that. He'd beat a lot of guys in the country, honestly. I mean, he's got a, a cannon arm, uh, prototypical size, a little on the thin side, but, uh, you know, good height. Um, but he just – it was a little bit of a struggle for him in the spring. He's been playing scout team quarterback for the last two years, and, and anyone will tell you that that's a tough thing to kind of snap out of, and, and he's admitted there was some rust. Uh, so, so Chris Laviano had the edge uh, coming out of spring practice. We're, you know, we're three days into training camp, uh, and it still looks like he has the edge. Uh, Reddick looks a little more comfortable. Kyle Flood is kind of deferring on really making too many uh, strong evaluations this early. He said he's going to make the, the decision on the starter sometime in the second week of camp. You know, that's kind of fast approaching. They have a scrimmage on Monday, which I think will go a long way to determine that decision. Uh, if you have to ask me right now, it's going to be, I would say, hands down, Chris Laviano. He's, again, he came in as the number one this summer. Nothing I've seen in practice has, you know, indicated that Reddick has moved ahead in the coach's eyes. Um, so I think, you know, if I was going to, Pencil on the starter for September 5th, it would be Chris Laviano. Okay, very good. Kyle Flood, of course, prides himself in the running game, being able to run between the tackles, and he's in the right league to try to prove that. Five running backs, either with uh, uh, quite a bit of experience or uh, very highly touted coming out of high school. So you have a combination here. The last time we saw Paul James on the field, uh, he ripped up Washington State. Big win for Rutgers early in the season last year before he got hurt the next game. You got Josh Hicks, who who was uh, productive last year, along with Robert Martin, Desmond Peoples as well. A lot of people excited about him, as well as Justin uh, Goodwin. So your thoughts about the running back position, and if Kyle Flood really wants a number one main guy or the running back guy by committee uh, process? Yeah, it's one of those situations where you never have too much of a good thing. And uh, Kyle Flood will always point back to they needed that depth last year because, as you said, uh, you know Paul James is out for the season. And by the end of the year, the end of the bowl game, Desmond Peoples was out and Robert Martin pulled his hamstring in the bowl game. So, you know, you, you need as many backs back there as you can have. And actually, Desmond Peoples has missed the first three days of practice, hasn't been cleared medically, uh, upper body injury. That's, that's the extent of the details we have. Uh, so they're, they're already down to four. That's still, you know, that's plenty. And, and Paul James, the biggest development is he just looks like Paul James. Uh, you know, you never know. Obviously, ACL surgeries have come a long way. But until you see each, how each individual responds, you don't know how they're going to bounce back. And, and he's looked great uh, early in camp. I would think that, you know, if things keep going that way, he's going to be the number one back. I mean, he, he the other guys stepped in and, and did a nice job. But Paul James is a dimension that uh, they just don't have. I mean, he's, he's an you know, explosive playmaker. Two years ago when he got hurt, he was leading the nation in rushing through four games. Last year he was basically on the same pace. So uh, he's, he's proven it a little bit more. He just hasn't proven it for a full season. Uh, and that's where maybe having that depth will help. They can, instead of giving him 30 carries, and maybe that's when he gets banged up. You can hold him back to 10 to 15 carries, uh, just reduce some of that wear and tear. 
Uh, you know, Robert Martin and Josh Hicks, two young guys who showed a lot of promise last year. I, I would expect to see them in the mix. And then Justin Goodwin is a guy who can do different things. So maybe you get creative and line him up in the slot or use him a little more in the passing game. So I think, you know, it's definitely a, a good problem to have. Uh, but I think at some point you do want to establish a pecking order. And I would say, uh, you know, as long as he's healthy, Paul James will, will be that number one guy. Leontay Carew is a player who could have ran off to the NFL, made the spirited speech after the bowl victory over North Carolina, declaring that he was going to return for his senior season. He's a given in regards to his talent and playmaking ability, and he's talked about some of the things that he'd like to improve on to get himself ready for the next level. Who are some of those guys that need to take some pressure off of Carew and um, you know, make, make the defense uh, have to play honest? Yeah, I mean, because he certainly – he got a lot of attention last year and produced, and, and he's only going to see more. Um, they, they do re, re, uh, return most of their top receivers from last year. They lost t Tyler Croft, the tight end, who's with the Bengals now, and Andrew Trezilli, who was a big play guy. But other than that, I mean, they have, you know, probably their five best receivers after Carew back. Um, it's going to be who can make that next step to be a solid number two, take advantage of the fact that defenses are going to be doubling Carew all the time. I think a guy to watch is Kyle Nagadosi, who – I mean, he looks the part. He's 6'6", 220 pounds. Uh, he's got good speed. And he's just been inconsistent. He's a redshirt junior. You've seen flashes of it in spring practice. Or, you know, every summer in the scrim in the first scrimmage, he seems to break out. And then he disappears when the games roll around. So I think he's a guy who is going to get the opportunity, uh, could really be a game breaker on the other side of Peru. Uh, and then they have some other guys who are a little more reliable, proven. Andre Patton's a guy who was looking like the number two receiver last year got hurt right at the end of camp. And it took him a while to really get back in the swing of things, but he still produced towards the end of the year. Uh, Janarian Grant is a real playmaker out of the slot. John Simmons is a, a solid guy with some big catches last year. So there's, there's definitely a lot of pieces there. I would say after running back, wide receiver is probably one of the deeper positions on this team. So, you know, really those guys' fate will probably mostly tie to the quarterback. And if, if they can get some confident quarter, quarterback play, I think they'll be pretty good at receiver. Dan, as you will know, uh, Big Ten fans that didn't take notice last year that are just getting accustomed to this football team and this football program and the approach are going to find out that this is almost a Wisconsin of the East in terms of pro-style offense running the football first and foremost. Um, it's one thing to have that approach and want to do that. It's another thing to have the horses, and that begins up front. You feel good about the uh, offensive line. Yeah, I mean, that, that's where they're probably different from Wisconsin. I think every uh, college team would love to have that offensive line they have. Uh, Rutgers has some, some good pieces back, but they have to replace three starters, guys who were, in some cases, four-year starters, two- or three-year starters. So that's a lot of experience to replace. Um, the good news is they've Keith Lumpkin back at left tackle, and he's just an anchor. Uh, you know, and obviously you're going against some great pass rushers in, in the Big Ten, so it's important to have a guy like that on the blind side. And then they have Chris Muller, who started the last two years at right guard. He's back, most likely to be at right guard. He could move to center. But it looks like a, a retro junior there. Derek Nelson has that job locked down. Uh, right tackle is a kid, uh, J.J. Denman, who kind of platooned last year. So, he, you know, he's almost like a returning starter in the sense that he, it won't be his first time, you know, getting in the live fire. And, and then left guard is, is, a, is a question mark. Um, but, again, it, you have these guys who were behind good players. So you don't know if they're ready to step up because they, they weren't needed. You know, you had guy Caleb Johnson started 50 games in a row at left guard. So is his backup, Dorian Miller, going to be right at – to, to fill that void, we won't find out until this season, you know, because there really wasn't a need for these guys to play much in the past. Um, but I think anyone will tell you it's not ideal to have to replace three offensive linemen. Uh, it's going to take some time, I'm sure. And, and obviously, like I said, you're going against some really good defensive lines in the Big Ten. So they're certainly going to be put to the test. Dan Dugan joining us from NJ.com. I'll take a broad stroke view of the defense and then let you grind it down to the positional units. 106th against the run. That's not too favorable, especially in this conference. Uh, some observers around college football would be hard pressed to recognize that uh, Rutgers has produced over the last 10 or 15 years some of the better secondary talent in the NFL and also a defensive end. Uh, it would surprise some people the numbers that have gone from Rutgers defense and transitioned to the NFL. Darius Hamilton's an exceptional talent. You've got experience at secondary. What's what's the good and what's the bad here? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, they have that reputation, uh, you know, under Greg Schiano and, and early in the Kyle Flood era, but it's kind of gone off a cliff because they lost a lot of talent to the NFL. And obviously, you know, it's tough to replace those guys. And two years ago, the pass defense got absolutely shredded. Last year, the run defense got absolutely shredded. So you have to wonder maybe this year they can kind of 
uh, sure that up on both ends. Uh, again, it's going to be tough with some of these offenses they'll face. Uh, but they, they have uh, some pieces at every level, but there's also question marks at every level. The, the, I'll start with the linebackers because you have Steve Longa back at weak side linebacker. He's led the team in tackles the last two years. So you can kind of pencil him in for 100 tackles. And, and you know, they actually need him to be more of a playmaker. Uh, another guy, Quentin Gauze, who's back for his second year starting a strong side linebacker. Those two positions are pretty set. The middle is a, a big question mark, but they have some interesting pieces there. They have Kawan Lewis, who was a grad transfer from South Carolina, guy who started 10 games as a sophomore in the SEC. So you, that alone, you know, his resume is going to get your attention. And he'll be battling with the junior college transfer, Isaiah Johnson. Uh, and that'll be an interesting battle to see how that unfolds because Lewis just got to campus the other day. So he's going to have some catching up to do. Uh, the, on the defensive line, the pass rush was pretty good last year, and a big part of that is uh, defensive end Moko Ture. He was one of these guys who really just – came from off the radar and ended up being a freshman All-American uh, at seven and a half sacks, three block kicks. He's really just a freak athlete and really didn't even play uh, high school football until his senior year. So he's really getting by on, on kind of his raw athleticism and he's you know getting up to speed with the coaching. But this could be a huge jump for him this year because last year he was pretty much just a pass rushing, spe pass rushing specialist. Say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, now they're trying to make him a three down guy. And you just figure if he's on the field more with his talent, he's going to be you know that much more of a playmaker. You mentioned Darius Hamilton. Uh, he's a guy who's really you know, basically the leader of the team, returning captain. Uh, he's been banged up, though, and he's been limited the first couple of practices. So it'll be interesting to see if that's something um, that's going to be more of a concern. Uh, beyond that, they just have some other pieces on the defensive line. that, that They have some depth there, and it should be okay. It's going to need to be a lot better in the middle because, you know, as we've said, the, the, the rushing defense really struggled last year. Secondary is where I think there's the biggest question marks. Um, mm -hmm. They basically are going to have to replace all their starters back there. Um, they, their starting cornerback, Nadir Barnwell, is looking pretty unlikely that he'll be eligible academically. They had another cornerback kicked off the team who was a uh, projected starter for getting arrested for armed robbery uh, during the offseason. Obviously, that's not a good situation to have to deal with. And they lost their starting safeties from last year. So, you, have, you know, basically some guys who played back there and started some games, but you're basically, you know, kind of starting from scratch with the four guys who be back there. A lot of inexperience, a lot of position battles going on. And, and when you have Connor Cook and Christian Hackenberg and Washington State's offense and Ohio State, whoever ends up being that quarterback, it's going to be a tall task uh, for a young secondary to get up to speed quick. So I think that could really make or break uh, this season. Kyle Federico, 16-21 to 21 on the field goals and Rutgers. You could probably win some trivia contests here. Leads the nation in blocked kicks in the last six seasons with 41. And Komoko Ture, if I pronounced his name correctly, with three block kicks and saving the game against Michigan with a blocked uh, field goal attempt there. The interesting question and um, conversation for me, Dan, before we let you go, is the entry into the Big Ten. One season under Rutgers' belt, it was fairly successful holding ground, beating who they were expected to beat, aside from the Maryland win, which was a bit of an upset, and then winning the bowl game, holding ground in the Big Ten, although there is a gap uh, versus the elite teams, giving up like a 180-44 to 44 scoring advantage there against the likes of Wisconsin, Ohio State, Michigan State, Nebraska. So as a beat writer, is it uh, – you know, you've had to adjust your mindset from the Big East and the American Athletic Conference now to the Big Ten and studying those teams and getting accustomed to that. What's what's the reaction of the fan base? Did did they like winning in the other two conferences and now knowing it's going to be a daunting task to win a division championship, get to a, a major bowl game or a Rose Bowl or that Big Ten championship game? Or is this a welcome challenge? Uh, well, I mean, I only came on the beat uh, midway through the uh, 2013 season, so they were losing in the American. So any, that, that's about <laughs> as low as it goes. So being, you know, at least competitive in the Big Ten was uh, certainly a step up. Um, just broad stroke with the fan base. They're thrilled. I mean, to be in the Big Ten is just a game changer for this whole athletic department, top to bottom. And obviously, you know, football kind of drives the bus. So, And they had, a, they had a good, solid first season. I mean, I think fans went in cautiously optimistic. Most observers, most people like myself didn't think they would do very well. Uh, so they certainly turned some heads. I mean, eight and five, it looks pretty good on paper with a bowl win. Uh, and, but like you said, there is that gap. I mean, they, they got pretty well manhandled against the top teams in the Big Ten. And I think that's the little asterisk on last season. It's like, sure, you, you took care of business against, the, you know, the Maryland's and Indiana's. And obviously Michigan was a nice win. Uh, people here still kick themselves over losing the Penn State game. Uh, but you do realize that you're, you're, they're, they weren't at the level of Ohio State and Wisconsin and Michigan State and Nebraska to some extent. 
So I think that people want to see that that gap close a little bit. I mean, I don't think anyone has any illusions of they're going to be in the final four and challenging Ohio state for the East division title this year. You just want to see some progress. If they can kind of maintain as eight, seven, eight, nine win seasons, and you just maybe put a scare into Ohio state or you do knock off Nebraska, something like that would be some progress, but big picture, they're just thrilled. I mean, they're, they're they got to seat at the table. That's pretty much all you can ask for. I think that there's, Still a hope hasn't totally materialized yet that being in the Big Ten will be a boost to recruiting, especially kind of keeping these Jersey kids home who, who for years have had to leave Jersey to go play big time football. Uh, like I said, hasn't really cashed in just yet, but I, I think as time goes on, you know, it'll take some time to change perceptions. And then I just think that financially you can't ignore that. I mean, there's those Big Ten checks will start rolling in in a couple of years, and that could be a game changer for an uh, athletic program that's always in the red. So I, all, you add all that up. I mean, there's really not too many uh, cons in this equation for Rutgers. I mean, obviously, yeah, you you, you know, you've got to have, could have got to a BCS game in the Big East, but I don't think anyone would look at that nearly the same as if they can ever get to that level in, in the Big Ten. So I think uh, everyone is pretty much thrilled with where they're at and, and just kind of hoping that they can kind of keep things on a little bit of an upward trajectory. All very good points uh, with Rutgers getting underway in three weeks. A uh, little bit of a Rutgers season preview with Dan Dugan of NJ.com. Dan, we appreciate the information and the insight. Hopefully we can have you on uh, sometime soon. All right. Thanks a lot for having me.